Good morning, and you're very welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar. My name is Pat Murphy, Head of Environment Knowledge Transfer with Chagask, and I'm joined this morning by a, a, a number of, of, of uh, people to help us talk about the Ratcrone EIP, uh, which is a, pro a heritage project about uh, protecting our, our, our preserving our past and, and protecting the, the future of our, our heritage. Uh, uh, Daniel and Richie, if you'd uh, turn off mute there and, and uh, come on screen. Uh, this is part of our contribution towards Heritage Week, which begins tomorrow and goes on through to the, the, the 20th. I'm also joined by, by Catherine Keena, uh, our biodiversity and landscape uh, uh, specialist here in Chagask. Catherine, you're very welcome. Thanks, Pat. Good morning. Uh, Daniel, you're joining us from what part of the world this morning? Uh, this morning, I'm joining you from, from South Common, the parish of Top McConnell, uh, but I, I operate out of uh, the village of Tulsk in uh, north of Common town, so it's about mid Roscommon, uh, effectively on the N5, the main Dublin to Castlebar Road. Okay, and maybe you just give us just a, a, a tiny pen picture of what, what Rat Crone project is, is about and, and, and what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, so in in about 2015, we were kind of striving to figure out opportunities that would uh, increase the 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 value of Rathcrohan to all involved. Because I'm operating as the manager of the visitor centre, so we provide interpretive um, experiences and guided tours around the archaeology. But in many respects, the the local community, the farming residents, would wouldn't have seen any any um, resource or any great value or sustainable kind of. Um, uh, interest by virtue of the, having the heritage on their land moreover more likely to be negativity more than anything else so i suppose the the beginnings the, the origins of our farm in rathcraw and eip was at a meeting in 2015 um where we tried to get all the stakeholders starting with the very very local those that are actually the custodians of the archaeology out on the land itself um, and the other various different stakeholders bring them into a room together and start querying what could we do in order to try and effect change um because there's no base plan there's no kind of a blueprint that we could have followed from from different locations elsewhere and that was basically the beginnings of the farm and rath Brahan project um which has been running since uh 2018 up until the present and um look we would and i'm sure we will outline uh, has been very successful to date okay listen uh, if you would uh share your your presentation with us and and, and we'll begin just just to re-outline yeah my name is daniel curley i'm the manager of the rath Crohan visitor center and i'm the secretary of the farming rath Crohan uh scheme clg so I suppose just to copper fast on what we spoke about briefly, um, Rathcrohan, it's an archaeological landscape, um, about 6.5 square kilometres in area. And you can see an aerial image, a satellite aerial image of the core of the Rathcrohan area. You can see the yellow star on the map of Ireland, and that's where we're located, Midrus Common. Um, so within this um, aerial image, there's actually 240 identified archaeological sites, um, and they're located um, in some cases several of them within farmers holdings um and some of them very very low relief and some of them very very prominent 60 of them are registered as national monuments which means that they have a level of state care or legislation attached to that and all of those 240 archaeological sites which is one of the densest concentrations of archaeology to be found anywhere on the island are contained above the 120 meter contour line above sea level so there's a very very deep concentration of them in one very localized area so this is a, a, a LIDAR, a light detection and ranging um, 3D model of the same plateau. And you can see from the aerial image through to the LIDAR, a number of features are, are becoming more prominent as you look at the 3D model. And uh, you can start picking out um, with your own um, eyes the, the various different features that are, are looming out from the page. Um, to make it more clear, uh, these red dots represent recorded archaeology. And as you can see, it does a, a very dense concentration in this um, discrete area. So collectively, these uh, survivals um, present a narrative of continued human settlement of Rathcrohan from the early Neolithic period, so from about 5,500 years ago up until the later medieval period and, and everything in between. Um, we have a very particular high point of activity occurring in the Iron Age, and particularly the late Iron Age, so you're talking about 2,000 years ago, and that puts us in alongside a group of five other sites that are currently on a tentative list for inscription onto the UNESCO World Heritage Status List um, under the banner title of the Royal Sites of Ireland. So, so the listeners and, and the audience today may be familiar with sites such as the Hill of Tara, County Mead, 
uh, Dunalana in um, in Old Kilcullen in County Kildare, the Rock of Cashel, the Hill of Ushnock, ourselves, and also Owen Mock or Navin Fort in Armagh. And that's the collection of six that are under that banner title of the Royal Sites of Ireland. So the mythological and literary landscape of Rathcrohan, it echoes the archaeological remains, uh, meaning that Rathcrohan possesses one of the richest heritage landscapes on the island. And we mentioned our royal sites of Ireland. So the archaeological remains present with profound insight into Ireland's past, coupling this with the, the, the corpus of early medieval literature. Uh, surviving in our manuscripts only serves to elevate this status even further. Um, and how we tie in very deliberately with farming, even if we don't even realise it, um, Rathcrohan serves as the focal point for an entire series of Ulster cycle cattle raiding tales, Tawna tales in Irish, a particularly prominent literary theme in the manuscript tradition. Um, the key tale of this uh, mythological cycle of the Ulster cycle is the cattle raid of Cooley, Cooley being on the eastern seaboard. And this is our national epic. This is our equivalent of the Iliad for the ancient Greeks or Beowulf or the Nibelungenlied. And, and we should be very proud of that. It's the oldest vernacular epic written in Europe and it's centred around Rathcrohan, Midras Common and obviously the journey across to the east. So it begins and ends at Rathcrohan. It surrounds the Great Iron Age Queen that may be familiar to listeners, i.e. the Queen, Queen Maeve of Connacht, one of her husbands, Alan MacMatha, Conor MacNassa, the King of the Ulstermen, and the boy warrior, Cú Cullen. Aside from this, Rathcrohan is also described in the literature as one of the great heathen or pre-Christian cemeteries of Ireland and a location of one of the great Einigi or great seasonal assemblies of the island as well. And this is a, an early medieval um, Enoch or great fair or assembly um, as kind of reproduced or, or, or reconstructed within the core of the Rathcrohan area, which sees it to be a lot more lively than it is today. So this cross section of archaeology, mythology and history provide the ability for us to um, kind of live up to that status of the, the royal sites of Ireland. In terms of farming, uh, Rathcrohan, its physical character, it's a bedrock composition of carboniferous limestones, uh, which is dotted with dolines, swallow holes, outcrops, and caves. And its soil and vegetation, you've got the glacial till that serves over the majority of the, um, the core of the area in particular, with an average soil depth of uh, one metre. Um, it's a fine loamy drift, and it's excellently uh, given over to the production of grassland. And the core of the area, as I've talked about already, is um, above the 120 metre contour line. And this is one of the monuments that uh, we would see as part of the Rathcrohan landscape. So this is a ring barrow burial mound, one of 37 that locates themselves within the core of the area. And something that may be familiar to the audience in the, in the, in the terms of what they see in their own land holdings are familiar in their own local areas as well. From an agricultural character, the core area is about 725 hectares. The core of the landscape is farmed by about 50 farmers. The majority of them are part of time. The average farm size is uh, 20 hectares and pastoralism dominates. Um, uh, like most of, of west of the Shannon, um, it's it's a it's a pastoral economy. So 91 percent of the Rathcrohan farmers questioned um, are keeping cattle, 43 percent keep sheep and 8.6 keep dairy cows. And the demographics of the community um, farming the land there, the proportion of farmers under 45 uh, in 2010, which is obviously increasing substantially. Um, ranges from 17 to 22 percent and again the image we see here is of uh, this uh, one of the more low relief features that are on the landscape a, a medieval field boundary as you see it going diagonally from left to right um, at the bottom of the image there and the traditional farming practice observed on the ridge so my position in the matter uh Tulsk action group the local community endeavor set up in 1996 uh, by virtue of uh, a series of archaeological surveys that were undertaken by the University in Galway, um, where they began to explore the, the, the fabulous archaeological remains at Rathcrohan through the Archaeogeophysical Imaging Project. And this inspired the local community to consider that their own local heritage was actually of a, a, a much higher importance uh, than they maybe have recognised previously, that the wider world is actually interested in this fabulous place. And they sought to kind of use um, Rathcrohan as an economic driver for the area. So by 1999, they obtained funding um, from Falch Ireland, what it was as the Irish Tourism Board, Tourist Board, and they set up the provision of a museum, which is operating now since nearly 25 years going. Um, and in the intervening years from 99 to present, the role of the visitor centre has developed. So that has become the authoritative interpretive experience and resource hub for this landscape. However, it's not a smooth process, and that's where our farming project becomes very important. So there are a series of challenges in developing a heritage-based community tourism resource. Um, 
These include the, the landscape size. We've got six and a half square kilometers within which the, the core of the archaeology is located. We have a large collection of landowners with differing um, interests in terms of the heritage value in the area or willingness or interest to have people access the land. Uh, geographical separation between the facility and the sites. So the facility at the museum is located three and a half kilometers down to the southeast from Rathcrohan itself. It's in the village of Tulsk, and that has its own um, nuances. Uh, funding requirements, uh, due to the fact that it's a local community non-profit charity, um, we're not state um, supported in any great extent. So we're operating basically off the revenues and a small operational budget provided by Hubble, our CSP program. And then in order to try and ensure that we are the authoritative um, interpretive centre and resource hub for Rathcrohan, we are constantly having to build and maintain an academic reputation. Um, we have to explore tours and markets that wouldn't routinely come to the, the Midlands uh, over time. Um, it's obviously on the West Coast and Dublin and places as such. So coming into the Midlands to explore, it's we're, we're operating in a different um, field in some respects. And then coupled with that, because of the landscape size and the collection of farmers, uh, we've unmanaged access onto monuments from visitors that want to perceive sites but would have no familiarity with local conditions um, and, and, and the need for permissions to access sites. We also have obstacles relating to farming and living in Rathcrohan. Um, there, anecdotally, there wouldn't have been a new, a new house built at Rathcrohan in the last 30 years. And that is in large part down to the sensitivity of the archaeological landscape and the limitations that that puts on the farmer and the local community in order to try and uh, place themselves up there and then we've got you know the, the 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 similar aspects that you would see in other parts of rural Ireland declining incomes migration and immigration as well um i suppose it is very acute in terms of the the difficulties in terms of trying to uh, obtain a modern farming practice out at Rathcrohan, and that is in large part due to the sensitivity of the built remains and so the image on our left hand side here is the series of a purpley pink dots and, and circles and features. These are what we refer to as archaeological zones of notification. So if anyone has archaeology on their land or in the near vicinity in the neighbourhood, ordinarily uh, one of those small circles might represent a ring fort and it represents about a five metre of a, of a buffer zone surrounding the monument itself. And that's what they described as the archaeological zone of notification. What that effectively means is ministerial consent is required to break ground in those areas. So in a normal consequence, you might have one ring fort in a townland. Um, in the case of Rathcrohan, you can see that the core of the area here is um, very well served by zones of notification. So entire fields, in some cases, entire farms are, are zoned within these archaeological zones of notification, which means it's incredibly difficult to in engage in normal farming practice, um, as we would expect in other parts of the island. So these are the types of matters that uh, the, the farming community has to operate around. So. Some of the other issues are not limited to, but do include unmanaged public access and trespass on farmland, traffic routes and congestion through the area, littering, unpermitted public gatherings, unlicensed camping, damage to farm properties, illegal burning activity and illegal metal detecting on protected archaeological monuments. And it's always important to note and reiterate the fact that uh, metal detecting without a, an archaeological license on a, on a, an archaeological monument is illegal in Ireland, and uh, that must be stated. So in the past, all of these um, multifarious features of the way in which Rathcrohan has presented itself into the late 20th and into the 21st century has, has developed very poor relations between the visitor interaction, the tourism enterprise at Rathcrohan, which I you know, um, would represent, and the local residential and farming community. And the whole matter uh, has been, I suppose, our attempts to try and effect a change to that. And the Farming Rathcrohan EIP is what has uh, allowed us to see um, for the first time a significant easing in that, but it's all locally derived and it's, it's coming from our own minds, our own motivations, our own commitment to it, as opposed to expecting the wider world to assist us in the matter. So, look, I mean, what you can consider, you know, everything from traditional farming practices we see on the left hand side, they would be part of the normal uh, rubric of Rathcrohan up until the relatively recent past. And then we're probably all very well familiar with uh, what we're currently engaging in, in modern Ireland from a farming point of view. From native breeds to mixed grazing to smaller vehicles through to uh, spreading of our, our slurry or our manure or um, in, a, in a, a less invasive way. Um, that has an impact on a sensitive archaeological landscape such as this, and this is just a, a, a gallery of the various different, um, in um, I suppose, disruptions to the 
the landscape as a result of that um, type of farming practice. There's also the impact on the monuments themselves, and there's just four instances there of um, damage to the archaeology, which is something that our farming project then tries to um, restitute or try and uh, resolve and ensure it doesn't continue, and in some cases to reform some of the issues that have presented themselves as being very stark. Unmanaged access then also leads to, uh, and the change in, and loss of landscape character, this will be an area very, very strongly um, given over to stone walls, dry stone walls in, in the past, and that is starting to, to wane, unfortunately. Um, but also, you know, unmanaged um, visitation onto sites in private land or on cul-de-sac roads obviously leads to disgruntlement amongst the local community as well. So that is, in effect, the, the, the background to why we tried to attempt um, to alleviate the issues by this collaborative approach. And as I said at the outset, uh, 8th of October 2015, we brought the broad range of stakeholders with our farming community at the core of it. Uh, with a view to developing uh, Rathcrown into a resource for the benefit of all. So we have in the image there just a, a kind of a, a catchment of the various different uh, people involved. We have three farmers in the image. We have one of our archaeologists from the University in Galway, our heritage officer, and we have a Chagas advisor as well um, at one of the public meetings. Um, so EIP, locally led schemes, the European Innovation Partnership. And it's important to note that our EIP is the only European Innovation Partnership in Europe to focus on the preservation of built and cultural heritage, um, which we're very, very proud of, but also leaves us in a bit of an unusual space from the point of view of uh, continuing our project beyond its current life cycle. So with that, I can um, disengage. And if it's a case that Richie can set up, then. OK, thank you very much. That's very clear. And I, I suppose a really clear uh, a statement of, of, of what the issues that, that you are facing. Richie, if you would turn on your camera there. Great. Uh, we, we see you there. You're very welcome, Richie. Uh, Good morning. So you're the the, the pro you've been the project manager of the of the EIP for the last number of years. I have indeed, and I have taken up the position from uh, my colleague Ben Petra Cock Abergreen, who was um, <clears throat> previous to me, um, and I came into the job like uh, last November uh, at a very probably critical and crucial part in the proceedings, um, because. Um, we had a huge body of work to complete. Um, I can all know, can you see my screen? No, not yet. Not yet. Good. Not very good at this sort of stuff sometimes. That's okay. Sorry, now. Yeah. Pat, just while he's setting up, can I say a word about Heritage yep. Week? Please um, do. So, yeah, as Pat said, this is um, Heritage Week starts tomorrow, the 12th to the 20th initiative of the, the Heritage Council. Um, Chagas are contributing uh, to just to promote it and and do our little bit. And we particularly I want to highlight the built and the natural heritage. So today is the built heritage, the old built heritage. Um, and next week we have Ian and Ilana uh, talking about safeguarding our wildlife to, to promote the natural heritage, because heritage does include all those, you know, built and natural. And we want to kind of stress that. Um, <clears throat> as Daniel said at the outset, the, the number of stakeholders involved, we, we don't work alone. So uh, the group, the operational group has a number of representatives on it. And we through that, we have access to a range of knowledge and experience and expertise. So we have the National Monuments Service who are part of the group, Roscommon County Council, who are represented through the Heritage Officer, to members of the Chagas Board, and um, <clears throat> also we link to link in with the OPW as well. And we have new partners who occasionally come on board, like the Roscommon Leader Partnership at the moment, because we're following some developments in the project to date. Next slide, Daniel. Um, you can keep going. You've kind of, kind of covered these are the key areas. In it. That's the heat map. That's the royal sites. The aims and objectives of the project were, of course, what we wanted to do, and as Daniel has rightly alluded to, is that this is kind of kind of a bespoke project, project, but uh, the important part of it is that while we have been running it now for five years, uh, we have only in many respects scratched the surface. So what we want to do is to ensure that the continued sustainable management of the Krahan landscape can continue. And I'd like to point out that the system itself is a result-based uh, scheme with the partnership, which means 
basically that they get uh, rewarded for the work that they complete in terms of the archaeological interventions and and actions that we agree with them during the year and we all they're a com combination not alone of the preserving the archaeology as daniel has referenced to it but also the kind of unique aspects of the landscape as well so it's kind of a whole of landscape approach to what we're trying to do and we're also piloting systems to provide the public managed access on, on the farms and Daniel and, and then the Backrock and Venice Centre are engaging in the moment with a, a new way mark loop walk, which was a game changer in terms of how the access to the farms will continue. That will impact on our project as well. So we're very much working uh, closely together on that. The project also provides uh, ample training opportunities for the farmers, and I'll outline those just kind of shortly the type of work we do there. And of course, we want to increase the awareness and recognition of Rack Crahan. So at the moment, we're in a kind of a full kind of promotions and publicity push for the for the Rack Crahan project, not alone the fact that we are coming to the end of its current cycle, but also we're trying to advocate, of course, for its regeneration and renewal. And of course, we have to remember that the farming is an integral part of the local community here. So the project is supporting the viability of the farms and is supporting the changing farming practices. Next slide, please. Uh, I think Daniel might have touched on this in terms of the core area, the number of sites in it and the actual uh, farms in it. At the moment, we have uh, 45 farmers kind of in the scheme. 31 or 32 of those are kind of full time into the scheme. And we have 12 more, uh, uh, which are trainee farmers, which we involve in a number of training actions that are kind of part of it as well. And of course, we want to extend the project really out further. The average farm size is about 20 hectares. As Daniel said, it's kind of predominantly pastoralism, which keep cattle and sheep. And, and of course, the demographics and the proportion of farmers under 45 years of age ranges from 17 to 22 percent. Next slide, please. Um, we work with the farmers to ensure uh, the legal requirements are uh, addressed. I mean, that's important. The, the zones of notification, as Daniel mentioned, are important as well. And it's important that the farmers are aware. I think what the project has done uh, is bring a great structure to that, that there's a focal point and an office where farmers can come to and discuss issues and see can we do this and can we do we do that they'll also good engagement with how we support new farming practices in terms of no ground interference for it but there are ways around which the work can be done and um, there's a greater appreciation of the role of farming that it plays in protecting the environment we can't deny that that is a huge big ticket issue for agriculture and the and the rock crown farming project is very conscious of that fact and involved in it uh, we deliver positive outcomes and rewards for the farmers, which cannot be denied. And of course, we are, I think, uh, moving in the right direction in changing the presence uh, mindset around the presence of archaeology. It's not a negative thing. Next slide, please. Um, so that we're we're kind of balancing the need to protect the landscape and support the farming. So in terms of what livestock choices they can use in terms. Uh, in the past, it would have probably been a lot of lighter livestock used, uh, but of course, it's a very much a production based system agriculture now. So the stock and livestock are getting heavier. So there's always a little discussion around that as well. We have a good bit of discussion within our plans about the grazing of the monuments. They're, they're the best way is to keep the monuments is to keep them grazed. So there's the regimes as part of the farm plans to use for that. Um, types of machinery that are used. We've had a wonderful talk from Chalkist recently about the use of heavy machinery on it. Um, the terms of farm outputs, that the pressure is being put on, the income support that it fights, the farm viability, and of course, the future sustainability and climate agenda. Next slide, please. Um, we mentioned that before we had 31 farm, 45 altogether. We want to hopefully uh, putting plans and proposals uh, together at the moment in terms of an application to the Department for Renewal. As part of that, we would like to extend out to 60 farmers to include it because we have many people who want to be involved in the scheme, which is a good reflection on the success of the project to date. Um, and the core area is now managed uh, by the farming rock area. Next slide, please. 
um, you can keep going, Daniel. I think we've covered that kind of that. Kind of how do we do this on the ground on a practical level? Well, we do a minimum of two visits per year to farms. And we kind of identify within the farm plans kind of the interventions that need to take place. And if the farmers complete those, and I would go back out to ensure that the work is done satisfactorily, the payments, result-based payment would be issued. Now, that would be issued. Payments, for example, in 23 would have been paid on basis of work that was completed in 22. And then we're now in the middle of kind of the action-based payments process for kind of this year as well. We've also introduced two years ago uh, the biodiversity uh, actions which we produced uh, biodiversity plans for each farm uh, areas that would be uh, need to be looked at and um, we had a number of kind of wildlife uh, species uh, and plants that we kind of had identified we're putting in buffer strips and areas around water sources as well so that they're part of the payments they farmers get as well as for the biodiversity of course the whole is linked to three or four uh, aspects of it, which are kind of the archaeological features themselves, because as Dan said, a lot of the farms have a good few archaeological features, and uh, the payments is based on, on how the farms have these features. And some of them have national monuments. It's related to grassland protection, how they are, that is working, how the water and ponds and the wetlands are being protected, and how looking at the old fieldways and trackways, which running are crisscrossed through the landscape. Uh, next, next slide, please. That is a uh, typical sample of, of a farm plan, uh, with picture on the right. Um, we would agree the actions with the farmer, then we would draft up the farm plan and put uh, the items on the farm plan. So you can see from that, we would have an actions to the removal of damaging scrub. We would have repairing the traditional dry stone wall. Are we putting in stone reinforcements around the gap areas as well? We do a, quite a lot of that because we're kind of, kind of very concerned about kind of traffic and cutting up of ground at gap ways as well or because let's face it we have a fairly wet climate and a lot of heavy traffic so a lot of the work goes in into that we get the approval and the consents we go out and do the inspection visits and we issue the various payments now of course with all projects we have to keep an, an enormous amount of evidence and paperwork for it for the departmental purposes which we do and we monitor the sites on a kind of a regular basis and and kind of issue the biodiversity payments kind of at the end of within each year. Next slide, please. Um, and that will give you a result. When I talked about the result based uh, farmer payment schemes, the higher the quality, the work they do, they get the higher the payment. And we're creating a market for environmental and archaeological services and we're introducing complementary actions to improve the score. So over the period of the last few years, the average result-based score increased from 6.88 to 8.87. That would be kind of, they would be scored out of a, a 10 being, being the opposite. They would have been much lower than that in many cases, but the project has been very successful in improving the score of the farms over the lifetime of the project. Uh, and we would hope that if the project, and we were very optimistic, that the project will get renewed, we would be able to increase that even further. Next slide, please. Um, the biodiversity, I, we just mentioned it. There is a number of aspects to that. There's the whole wildlife in geology sample. We have 32 sample species indicators. We have look at various habitats and the scorecards in relation to those, the field margins, the wet areas, the water sources, and they have been introduced as part of the farm plans. And all of that is designed to take a whole of landscape approach. Uh, next slide, please. And um, we can run through these, Daniel, if you don't mind, because they're just the scorecards uh, with a lot of detail on them. Um, they look at the archaeology and they look at individual fields and decide whether they're in excellent condition, high condition, low or poor, um, depending on the archaeology in it, how it's pr being protected and how the water quality if it is in, in some of the fields are as well and how the grasslands and so sorts of very kind of detailed scorecard farming that farming of Crohan has, de has developed itself. And it's something that can be transferable to other projects should people wish to have a look at it. So, uh, 
some stage. You can move on, Daniel. Thank you. Um, so these are the kind of farm actions for 22, 23. We would have come over the last year, something in the order of 250 actions, over 31 farms. Um, monument repair with resting frames, restriction of livestock on monuments, precision grazing on the monuments, removal of scrub, water trough reinforcements, reinforcement of cattle tracks, repair of damaged grassland, and restriction of cattle at water sources and cattle crossing over streams and drains, which we kind of have uh, started doing. And a lot of the traditional dry stone wall maintenance, which we have begun in airiness this year. You can move on, Nadia. So this is a kind of a slide that will give you an example. I think Daniel mentioned had it in his presentation earlier. It's a sample of the state of one of the sites that before the, the project got management, and this is what it kind of looks like uh, after we, a natural kind of protection of it and let it regenerate itself and fence it off. So it kind of is a good sample of how very practical measure that, that the project uh, is succeeding at. Next, please. As part of the project, we've introduced a good few kind of farming products. Uh, it is, after all, a European innovation partnership project. So the innovation part of it is very, very keen. We have some of the resting frames, which and I'll have a slide on what they look like after. They're kind of meter and a half square of recycled with a grid on top of it. And what those are used are there are placed on kind of the monuments where kind of damage to the to the monument and erosion has taken place and there's a little solar panel and they're electrified and once the cattle go on them once they won't do it the second time so we allow it to recover naturally we have the down on your right hand side you'll have the little non-obtrusive fencing post there's no groundbreaking as such so where we have to put in electric fencings we use these uh, around the monuments or wherever they are required. We use a lot of ground reinforcement stone to protect gaps and trackways. We have introduced over the last week or two new bespoke cattle brushes. Those are the little, uh, <laughs> look like giant toothbrushes there in the middle. There's a huge concrete base on it that can be moved around on the landscape. And the idea of these was that to distract the livestock away from kind of hedgerows or scratching at monuments and all the rest of it, and they are proven hugely uh, popular at the moment. Uh, there is a huge demand for more of those. Uh, we have developed customized straining posts, a lot of geotextile membrane for the gaps, and we down on your bottom left, as part of the built and traditional uh, heritage of the project as well, we've started reintroducing the farm, uh, traditional farm gates, or the Rakrahan gates, which were typically designed along the old traditional wrought iron farm gates as well. Next slide, please. So that can give you an example of kind of the erosion of monuments where we would intervene from a wrestling frame point of view. We would have literally a hundred of these scattered around um, where they would have got damaged and then over time it will gradually recover by itself and on the bottom again you have another uh, extensive damage on archaeological monuments, which gradually improves over time as well. So the point that's probably trying to make there is that projects like these need time, uh, which we will say that the current project at five years is not enough. We've only begun to, to move, need what we have to do. Next slide, please. Um, the farmer training is very important part of it. Throughout the year, we will run a program of farmer training. Uh, which farmers also get paid for, for the number of training sessions that they attend. Uh, a lot of the training is to do sometimes with landscape repair. We have done some traditional hedge laying uh, earlier in the year, and we do that within the appropriate seasons for it. We started dry stone wall repairs on, on several locations this year, and we're doing another one again uh, uh, during Heritage Week. We've won... Uh, soil compaction nutrients, of course, with Chagas uh, and water quality. We are working with the our local Roscommon Sheep Breeders Association who are in trying to uh, reintroduce the Roscommon native sheep back into the landscape of the project we're kind of very excited about and we're giving them to support. We're running training on precision farming and grassy margins and pollinators 
And we've also been hooking up with the Farm Connect EIP, which is the whole farmer health and well-being uh, and safety. And we are planning to do some next year uh, around the whole area of agri business and ecotourism as well for farmers, because we have some interest in that area. That's the way of building resilience into the project itself and looking at in new avenues of developments that we can. Next slide, please. So that's just a sample of the environmental farmer training practices that we would, would have done uh, with the Chagas. You can move on, Daniel. Um, and on some of the areas we would have undertaken what we call specific works, where we would have identified a site that what is one of our farms in it. And this is the one at Rat Moor, which is very visible out on the road. So we're very conscious of the whole landscape appearance and how that reflects on the project. Uh, so that was to instill a bit of pride of place in it. So we undertake a series of improvement works, which included the dry stone wall. Uh, the farmers were involved in that themselves. As a, so there's a whole mehel uh, process going on there. And we did put a new background and gate into it to improve the public appearance of it. The farmer's contribution was enormous, so there's a great sense of ownership among them, and it contributes to the communal actions that we're doing. And we have further works designed for there in terms of the upgrading of information signs as well. We also putting in this week a scratching post in that site as well. So it's a kind of a miniature little landscape that can, people can see close up because we have the site access in terms of traffic pulling in. Next slide, please. Our current developments, of course, include the archaeological trialing works of Ratna Darf, which were very successful. These were specific trialing works uh, that were conducted at these two national monument sites in association with the National Monument Service. Hugely successful, uh, certainly uh, something that we will need to continue. There's a lot of learning for it and reports produced on it. Waymark Loop Walk, funding that which has come through which Daniel is working on it and we're very much a sister project with it so I think everybody's excited about that there's further works uh, conservation plans for the Owen the Gap proposed sites this is the the cave which is on one of the the farms in ours as well we're working with the leader program under their climate champions and Erasmus program as well because we're acutely conscious of the green and environmental agenda of farming uh, Rakrahan can potentially contribute to. Um, we have a big event coming up this next week on Friday, the 18th of August, which is kind of the Archaeology uh, and Sustainable Farming Rakrahan Conference, which is a key event in terms of getting stakeholders uh, and decision makers into a room and to try and see how we can progress the project beyond this year. We're all at the moment looking at the finalization procedures for the current project. Uh, we're contributing some findings to the EIP's best practice model. And um, we are have tentative discussions with the uh, potential alignment under the EU Just Transition Fund. And we're looking at a number of other funding models that we could potentially uh, secure should we not be successful with the 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 Department of Agriculture. Next slide, please. So that's our kind of current activities from a promotion and publicity point of view. Uh, with the conference coming up, we're developing a stronger profile for Rack Crahan. We were up at the Bloom Festival in um, June, which was a hugely successful event in terms of promoting the project, a great occasion to be involved in. The stronger links with the Royal Sites of Ireland, which Daniel has mentioned, we are, we are putting kind of digital content packages together at the moment for a mobile app development of virtual tour of Rack and um, we're working much closer I think now and hopefully with Roscommon County Council under their climate action strategy as well and as I said we're preparing the application to the DFM for the project renewal and regeneration and hopefully uh, successful developments with the Roscommon leading partnership at the moment and I'm almost there ladies and gentlemen next slide <laughs> Uh, well, that's just the bloom. You can move through that, Daniel. Thanks. And kind of that's the project overview. We have an established system of management and administration. Uh, we have a st an established network of agencies and partnerships, good governance, strong focus on the archaeological heritage and the farming knowledge and expertise, uh, good uh, experience in terms of management and administration of it. 
established network of suppliers, developed knowledge of tendering and procurement, good cooperation and support of the farmers, which I have to highlight because without the farmers, this doesn't work. They are the custodians of the landscape and have been for generations. They are acutely concerned as to where the project is going. And in my view, they are the real heroes of the project. Um, so we have an established pattern of engagement. We have a good track record of delivering results. We have a fully developed scorecard system for all the project. We have key performance indicators. We have a number of intervention and archaeological uh, interventions introduced. We've developed ranges of innovative products and supports, and we've implemented kind of innovative trialing works on specific sites. And we contribute to conferences and medias and national events. So overall, the project, I think, has been hugely successful. We are extremely, extremely busy in, in our final year, uh, and, but it is extremely enjoyable because it's a very noble and worthwhile endeavour. That's my contribution, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. And a, 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 a very interesting uh, contribution. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> usually fascinating what, you, what, what you've been doing. Uh, and uh, I suppose it's been a huge learning process for you, not just for, for your project, but, but the implications of that. Uh, what you have been doing looks extraordinarily like what has come to 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 be developed in terms of the cooperation projects in a, a slightly different context but it looks the, the mixture of i suppose general supports and then specific actions it, it looks to be something that you have really mastered in 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 that in that project and i suppose it asks the question about whether uh, a the, the the approach that's been taken in the cooperation projects, which are mainly upland, uh, could be extended. And is, is that the possible way for for ye to look look into the future in terms of the continuation of the project and the work you're, you're doing? Yeah, all of the EIPs, in my view, are unique. Mm. They are unique, and they are bespoke, and they are particular to the very to the very landscapes uh, and the projects that that they work. Um, the, the key part, of course, is the is the, the farmers themselves. I mean, you, I can't stress enough b because the the level of engagement that needs to be done and the kind of relationship building that needs to go on on a daily basis with with farmers because of the pressure, in my view, of, of the archaeology. For me, the key part of it is the pillars themselves. You, you have a whole archaeological tradition, but you have an equally strong farming tradition, mm. and then you have the whole myths. And legend cycle going with with it, so it's it's a lethal combination when you think about it in terms of, of where a project should be, and that can be a good thing and a bad thing because it can, it cuts across so so much, and uh, but but it also gives us huge leeway and potential in how we we can get it moved forward. There's a question in relation to the the loop walk that's been put in place, and I suppose it's it's a, a challenging area to 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 work in to try and make sure that you have permissions, that you have upkeep of the elements of the walk, that you have farmers on on board, and it is a I suppose an inconvenience at at one level uh, for for farmers in terms of the maintenance of of the walks and and making sure that there isn't damage, etc. How have you managed? to, uh, I suppose, deliver that? Uh, and and uh, I suppose, how much work was involved in working with farmers to do that? So I suppose um, the, the there was a very ill-advised conservation management plan done for Rathcrohan uh, by the state um, with Oxford Archaeology Company at the time, uh, about, about 15 years ago now. And it was, it was met very negatively because there was very little local um, um, contribution or, or sought contribution but there was one there was one matter that that seemed to have a little bit of value to it and that was the fact that they suggested a looped walk um so look we've kind of outlined quite readily like it's six and a half square kilometers in area is archaeology all over the place um it's it's the it's the envy of, of so many locations across europe um and yet you know each time you cross a field fence you're into a different farmer's holding so we were we were very conscious of the possibility of trying to arrest a lot of the problems that the farmers were seeing 
So it was a case that if there's a standing stone or a barrow or a ring fort um, in, in an individual farmer's field, despite the fact that we're trying to um, guide, uh, instruct, align people directly to sites that we have agreement for public accessibility, people will still un, unmanaged go across the land and interfere with livestock as a result, interfere with, with margins, field margins, stone walls, break fences in order to go and see this spawned monument. And it was leading to a lot of distress and a lot of um, negativity between the heritage providers ourselves and obviously our farming custodians. So there was these light conversations that were going on as we were trying to progress the EIP and try and get it to a point where it would be funded. And after having those discussions for a couple of years, um, we were trying to walk alongside it with the idea of um, applying for um, a walk scheme for Rathcrohan. So we would have identified that there are 11 farmers um, within a discrete area that we could provide a defined loop walk through archaeology, through the, 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 the most interesting, just for want of a better word, the ones that would be frequented if, if even unmanaged, um, and then try and put in the building blocks in place in order to see if we can develop a, 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 way, a, a waymark loop walking scheme that has all the infrastructure in place so that it is not ground intrusive in its own right. So even our styles will not break ground. These are another innovation that once they're physically out on the land and not on our architect's pages, and um, they will be added to Richie's schema of um, of innovative products that that are bespoke to farmed archaeological landscapes. Um, so this 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 approach is is basically ensuring that the farmers at the core of it, um, it'll be of a suitable standard that it'll be um, Sport Ireland approved for its insurances. And we will ensure that it gets onto the walk scheme by virtue of that, then the farmers are getting an annual payment, a small payment for the inconvenience of people traversing the land. So with those with those issues um, removed, i.e. insurance is placed on it, so there's no fear of public liability problems, and then coupling that with a small payment um, in recognition of the allowance to, to provide visitor access through their land. And then the, the capital infrastructure works that we would have funded through the outdoor recreation scheme. Um, that's how we're building it in order to, again, build resilience. And it would it would seem to me if it's a case that in two years or a year after the walking trail is in place, that would revolutionise how a visitor can access the sites and done in a manner that's you know consistent and accommodating the local community that we see, you know, coffee, uh, coffee machines in horse boxes and local traders, people maybe outside their own stone wall selling honey to the visitor that's walking past and kind of, you know, a micro version of what you would see in parts of the burn set, for instance. Um, so that's that's the, the, the view of it. And to be honest, it's a stepping stone situation. So, I mean, if we didn't have the farming project, um, we wouldn't even be able to ask these questions um, of, of the local community. Would you be willing to to view Rathcrohan in that little bit more of a sustainable resource and open your mind to the possibility of um, that little bit of more visitor access and kind of, yeah open the world really to Rathcrohan in, in a very sustainable and a very, very uh, measured way, because I don't want to see it turned into a new Grange. It's it's not going to be if, if we've anything to do about it. It's a case of doing it in a way that's consistent and with the community at the core. Yeah. OK, yeah, Catherine, right. a good few questions yeah, coming lots, in there. Lots of questions. It's a reminder to put uh, uh, questions into the chat. And um, for our and maybe a reminder to, to get through them if we could keep the answers short. We've only a few minutes left. Um, uh, and also a reminder to maybe some of our newer viewers this morning um, that the presentations and the recordings will be on the website um, available for forevermore. So that is, that always proves useful. Um, again, a reminder um, that the Heritage Week, there's loads and loads of events. I already mentioned the two Chagas um, promoted ones. There's lots of them, just heritageweek.ie and Heritage Week promotes built natural and cultural heritage. So all is involved in this project. Now back to the real world of money. Richie, what's can you give us an idea of what the farmers get? Um, average ranges, anything like that, annually or whatever. Well, let's put it like this: they all won't be going to Lanzarote or regular holidays or what they're getting. But uh, the average payment would work out at, in terms of the result based payment, would be about two and a half, three thousand. On top of that, of course, they get the action based payments, which is, you know, can be anything from. You know, a thousand to fifteen hundred euros. They get there's around there's four hundred two hundred euros per training session, yeah. four hundred euros, and and then there's the biodiversity payments as well. It would be important to point out that in the scope of the project itself, and the and the budget 
that's available to it, which was 984,000, well over 450 or 500,000 is going directly to the farmers. And okay. that's, that's, that's the key part of it. That's what the project is there to do. A lot of the farmers, as many people would know, have other incomes. It's very few that are full-time farming. So the, the project itself is enabling them to farm the landscape. And from my perspective, without the farming, if you took away the farming right now, what would happen to all of, of kind of the archaeology and all of the work that's been done to it? Because the farmers want to continue to live here. OK, um, there was a question about them resting frames, but that was asked, I think, before you showed the picture. So I think that's covered. Um, any ideas on how to deal with antisocial behaviour on the lands, littering, moving stones, etc.? Shotgun. Um, in, in many respects, it's an education thing and it's something that's not bespoke to Rathcrohan. It's something that we're seeing across um, Irish archaeology, Irish heritage sites in a general sense. But the value that we have, I suppose we're sometimes a little bit complacent about it, is that we have a very active year round heritage um, interpretive experience with qualified archaeologists on staff that are going out to site every single day. So if issues are occurring, they can be recognised very, very readily. But moreover than that, it's a case that they can also be um, they can be nipped in the bud in terms of if they're actually visible on site um, at the time. So we're, we're actually very obviously proactively kind of engaging in matters if, if they appear so that they're nipping them in the bud. And as well as that, the other thing that I'm very, very proud of is the fact that now that we have the farmers re-energised in terms of looking at their cultural heritage, their built heritage, their archaeology on their own lands in a positive mind, if they're going to great efforts to, to maintain it and mind it, they're also going to tell anyone that's going to be um, so, yeah. somewhat uh, anti-social in their behaviour um, to dis disengage from because at the end of the day, it's their holding and it's their custodianship over the land. So reinvigorating that and having 35, 40, even 60, 70, hopefully if we get a regenerated project, all looking towards the cultural heritage on their farm landscapes and saying, hold on, lads. This is ours. There's an ownership over it. It's a case that we won't let anything happen. And you are seeing small little increments on that as time goes on. OK, and lots of compliments coming in um, and people looking forward to the loop walk and the coffee, Daniel. <laughs> and, uh, congrats to all incredible efforts and insights into the cooperation projects in the in the locality and um, from a proud uh, Rathcrohan person. Um, and uh, can I add my my comments to that on, on, on how important this is for archaeology? I don't think maybe. Uh, Daniel and Richie, you realise it because I'm looking at it from a national point of view. As as you said, it's the only archaeological initiative that um, that we're involved in. So I'm obviously and and it's the right place to be because as, as you said of the density. Um, but to me, each archaeological monument on on each individual farm in every townland in the country, and I know you'd feel the same. And you know they're never going to be big enough for a project, but they are going to be. Um, I, I've no doubt they ca can be looked after through the um, agri environment schemes. And we're you we and you are leading the way on how to do this. And I would hope great hope um, from what Pat said there at the beginning. The the beauty of the current um, agri environment scheme is while the general scheme is tied down and there are archaeological small archaeological measures in it, um, but they're tied in for the five years. The uh, cooperation projects have an annual plan for farmers. So I think, and I know they're only getting off the ground and, you know, it is a lot, it's so many issues coming, but I would be very interested in working with you to get engage with the cooperation projects um, for each year for the next four years on how we can integrate archaeology into those. Uh, there's great hope there because, as I said, it's not just a fight. We don't have to wait for five years to get this off the ground to get, um, to get them in and that could benefit everywhere. Uh, Pat, I think we're well, just, just, just a final question in terms of over the, the years, are you seeing an increase in, in your tourist footfall? Is that is that one of the objectives that you want? You said you don't want to be a, a, a new Grange, but uh, somewhere in between. And, and are you seeing an increase? Yeah, I suppose from uh, it's not tied to, to myself, but when I started in 2023, uh, 2013, um, we, we cal calculated seven and a half thousand visitors came through the doors. Um, for you know everything from a cup of coffee to a guided to tour. Um, last year it was twenty six and a half thousand. So right. so it's a case that yeah you're constantly building the profile, but it is it's I, I don't want to see massive tra mass traffic through the area. My my first you know my first 
interest is is obviously preserving the archaeological monuments and and the community that mines it. So as well as that, the infrastructure isn't in place. Um, in order to to maintain that from on site, you know, in terms of the walking trail isn't in, in state there as of yet. So it's a case that you want to build up that resilience. But as well as that, there's no accommodation in the local area. So you're you're trying to just drip feed that little bit of positivity in every two, three month increments so that all of a sudden people are starting to look and say, OK, an Airbnb or a rented house or b and set up or you know, small, different. I wouldn't call them risk taking exercises, but that we just have this nice little gentle flow of extra positivity occurring all the time radiating out from the resource that is Rathcrohan. And if we can do that, I mean, in the next five years, you could see, a, you know, a, a very, very minded way that we can we can bring this place to the to the notice of everyone, but at the same time, making sure that those that are on the land are the ones that are at the core of it all. OK, I think we're going to have to leave it there. We're just got slightly over time. Mm -hmm. And thanks to all our, our uh, viewers for, for coming in. An absolutely fascinating insight into some of the things that we we tend to to overlook in 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 our landscape so it, it's it's and and it's really great to see the kind of work that can go on and i suppose it it echoes the positivity we get across a range of issues be it water quality be it archaeology that when you engage with farmers and give them a good reason for uh, uh for Absolutely. developing and and uh, uh restoring and preserving what they have they really get on board to, to try and do it uh, so thank you very much to to both of you and uh, just you. to to let you know next week we'll be joined uh by Ian and Ilana uh looking at safeguarding safeguarding our wildlife through the campaign for responsible rodenticized use. So really looking forward to that. Uh, and it will, will be, certainly be entertaining uh, as, as well as informative ne next week. So until then, thank you from all the team, from Mary, uh, from Andy uh, uh, and, and from ourselves. So see you next week. Thanks, Bye. Pat. Bye -bye.